order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Alex Sobel. Thank you. Question number one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this morning I have spoken to Sir Kim Darroch. I have told him that it is a matter of great regret that he has felt it necessary to leave his position as Ambassador in Washington. The, the whole Cabinet rightly gave its full support to Sir Kim on Tuesday. Sir Kim has given, Sir Kim has given a lifetime of service to the United Kingdom, and we owe him an enormous debt of gratitude. Good government depends on public servants being able to give full and frank advice. I want all our public servants to have the confidence to be able to do that, and I hope the House will reflect on the importance of defending our values and principles, particularly when they are under pressure. Mr Speaker, the whole House, Mr. Speaker, the whole House will want to join me in sending our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Tammy Minchell, the student paramedic who was killed in a traffic accident last week whilst on duty. This is a reminder of the members of all our emergency services who risk their lives each day on our behalf. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Alex Sobel. I'd first like to associate myself with the comments regarding the tragic accident last week. I am pleased to see the Prime Minister is wearing green. I hope it is not merely a green wash, as I welcome the fact the Government will legislate for net zero by 2050. But before they did, when their target was weaker, the Committee for Climate Change already reported they were going to miss their target. And today, they said that the policy ambition implementation now fall well short of what is required. Targets helpful, but what we need is policies that actually deliver. Clearly, the Prime Minister wants to leave a climate legacy, so will she bring forward the ban on diesel and petrol cars from 2040 to 2030 or earlier, and when will she end her government's opposition to cheap onshore wind power? Prime Minister. Well, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that, in fact, we have an excellent record in relation to our dealing with climate change as a government. We have, been, we have outperformed on our first and second carbon budgets from 2008 to 2017. We are on track to meet the third, and the latest projections suggest we are on track to deliver over 90 per cent of our required performance for the fourth and fifth carbon budgets, and we are the first major economy to legislate for net zero emissions by 2050. The UK is leading the world on, the, on climate change. I want to see other countries following our example. Jack Brereton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. North Staffordshire used to have one of the most extensive rail networks in the world, but now often people in stoke on trent have to rely on their cars. Would the Prime Minister join me in my petition to reopen Mere Station in my constituency as the next step to improving our local transport? Well, uh, can I say to my honourable friend, I know he's been campaigning on this uh, issue uh, for some time. I know he's met ministers to discuss this. I understand that this is in an area that's about to benefit from refurbished modern trains on the Crewe to Derby line from December of this year as part of the new East Midlands Railway franchise. In relation to the station at Mere, uh, the Department for Transport will have heard my honourable friend's call to reopen the station, and I know that he will continue to campaign on behalf of all his constituents. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. I too regret the resignation of Sir Kim Derrick. I think the uh, comments made about him are beyond unfair and wrong. I think he's given honourable and good service and he should be thanked for it and I think the whole House should join together in deeply regretting the, f uh, the feeling that he's obviously got that he must resign at this moment. I also join the Prime Minister in passing condolences to the family of Tammy Winchell who died as part of our emergency services giving service to people. Mr Speaker, many people welcomed the powerful points the Prime Minister made when she was first appointed about burning injustices in Britain. Does she agree with me that access to justice is vital in order to tackle burning injustices? Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that uh, there are many burning injustices that can be ca tackled in a variety of ways, and that is the action that I have taken, not just as Prime, uh, as Prime Minister, but also as Home Secretary. And I'll give him one example. The Race Disparity Audit, which shines a light on inequality in public services, a race disparity audit which shines a light on inequality in public services is enabling us to put into place action 
that helps to ensure that people across this country, whatever their background, whatever their background, will ensure that they have access to the public services they need. Corbyn. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the Legal Aid and Advice Act. That act, introduced by the post-war Labour government, gave all people access to justice, not just the rich, and was an essential pillar of a welfare state and a decent society. The Tory Lib Dem coalition slashed legal aid in 2013, and the results are clearly very unfair. The number of law centres and other not-for-profit legal aid providers has more than halved. There are now legal aid deserts across the whole country. Does the Prime Minister think that has helped or hindered the fight against burning injustices? Prime Minister. The point that I was making to the Right Honourable Gentleman and that he seems to fail to recognise is that, is that the whole question of burning injustices is not about, is not about uh, just access to the legal system. The question of dealing with burning... It's all very well members of the opposition benches from shouting about this. If, if the Labour Party actually really cared about burning injustices, they'd have done a darn sight more when they were in power to deal with them. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, some people have very short memories. It was the Tory... It's all right. It's OK. It's all right. It's OK. The Tory Lib Dem coalition cut legal aid, but also brought in fees for employment tribunals. The then Minister for Employment Relations, the Honourable Member for East Dunbartonshire, piloted that through the House. But since that time, my union, Unison, took the government to court and won, and as a result, employment fees were cancelled. The cuts to legal aid affect people, Mr Speaker, like Marcus. Like Marcus, a 71-year-old on pension credit, a leaseholder who is threatened with being evicted. And he says, and I quote, I've paid taxes and national insurance all my life. How is it right that I'm being bullied and threatened with homelessness? The state won't protect me. And he goes on to say, I've been working to 2am every night for the past six months collecting evidence. I've got no idea if I've prepared my evidence correctly. Doesn't Marcus, trying to save his own home, deserve legal aid to get proper representation in a court and be fairly heard? The Prime Minister! The right honourable gentleman. Obviously, I reckon, the, recognise the concerns that Marcus has about uh, taking, his, uh, taking his case. But the right honourable gentleman might reflect on the fact that a quarter of the Ministry of Justice's budget is spent on legal aid. We spent £1.6 billion on legal aid last year. We're committing to ensuring that people uh, can access the help they need into the future. But that is only one part of the picture. We've published a plan for legal support to maintain and improve access to support for those in need. And we're conducting a fundamental review of criminal legal aid fee schemes, which will consider criminal legal aid throughout the life cycle of a criminal case. So there are aspects of this issue that we are indeed looking at. But I think it is important, it is important that we ensure that we are careful with uh, the uh, provisions that we make for legal aid, and as I say, a quarter of the Ministry of Justice budget is spent on legal aid. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, just so everyone's aware of it, Labour is committed to restoring legal aid funding for family law, for family law, for housing, for benefit appeals, for judicial review preparation, for inquests and real, real action on immigration cases. And as we announced yesterday, we will end the leasehold scandal. The Department of Work and Pensions is failing disabled people. The Ministry of Justice spent tens of millions of pounds each year defending appeals, over two-thirds of which were won by the claimant. Rather than spending millions defending incorrect and often immoral decisions, wouldn't that money have been better used increasing poverty level benefits and providing legal aid yes. to disabled people wrongly denied their basic yes. dignity? Yes.
Minister. I'm not going to take any lectures from the right honourable gentleman on what this government has done for disabled people. We are committed to tackling the injustices that are facing disabled people so everyone can go as far as their talents will take them. Our spending on support for disabled people and people with health conditions is at a record high. We are seeing many more people, not over 900,000 more disabled people in work as a result of what this government has done. But if the right honourable gentleman is really interested in tackling injustices, then the biggest injustice he should tackle is in his own Labour Party and deal with anti-Semitism. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, my party is totally committed to eliminating racism in any form, anti-Semitism in any form. And while she is about the lecturing, how about the investigation into Islamophobia in her own party? Order! Order! Mr Bowie! You are as noisy as your illustrious late namesake, David Bowie, but sadly, <laughs> nothing like as melodic, my dear chap. Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, Mr Speaker, one lecture she might not want to take from me, but she might care to listen to what the United Nations said when they, and I quote, condemned the UK government for its grave and systematic violations of the rights of disabled people. The Windrush scandal has resulted in the government having to allocate £200 million in compensation to people wrongly deported from this country, denied services and their lives totally pulled apart. People have given their life to this country and our services. Does the Prime Minister think that scandal would have happened if legal aid had not been slashed by the government so many of those people were denied any representation in court? Well, the right honourable gentleman really needs to think rather more carefully about his arguments. Let's look about the issue of people in the Windrush generation. I've said I've apologised for what happened to people in the Windrush generation. I've been very clear. I've been very clear that they are British, they are here, they have a right to be here, and these should not have happened. We've apologised for the mistakes that have been made. But he raises questions about people, raises issues about people who were incorrectly deported. The initial historical review has uh, found that there were around 11,800 detentions and removals, uh, which they looked at. They identified 18 people who were most likely to have been wrongly uh, deported or removed. Of those, six were removed or detained under the last Labour ah, government. Ah, and I say to the right honourable gentleman, the way he talks, you would think he was a man of principle. But what do we actually see from him? Labour policy is to ban non-disclosure agreements, but his staff have to sign them. He was an anti-racist, now he ignores anti-Semitism. He's been a Eurosceptic all his life, now he backs Remain. He's li truly living up to the words of Marx. Those are my principles, and if you don't like them, I've got others. Not Honourable gentleman is keen to get to the dispatch box when the name Marx is, uh, is uh, identified. I was merely going to point out to him those were the words not of Karl but of Groucho. Jeremy Corbyn, coming from the Prime Minister, who, who created who created the hostile environment which brought about the Windrush scandal, who ordered go home vans who ordered go-home vans to drive around London, who refuses to acknowledge Islamophobia in her own party, and, and whose party consorts with racists and anti-Semites in the European Parliament and sucks up to those governments across Europe. We don't need those kind of lectures. One legal aid firm... Mr Speaker, one legal aid firm said we see... We see more people more desperate and in more extreme need than they were five years ago. There is nowhere to send them. 
Those people are invisible to the system. This is a denial of people's basic rights. The UN says legal aid cuts have overwhelmingly affected the poor and people with disabilities. Without equal access to justice, there is no justice. Today, in modern Britain, millions are denied justice because they don't have the money. Isn't that a disgrace? Isn't that a burning injustice? Prime Minister! Right honourable gentleman, he may do his best to ignore the anti Semitism in his party, but I think he should listen. I think. I think he should listen to the words of the former Labour Party General Secretary, the noble Lord, Lord Treesman, who said. We may one day be the party of anti-racism once again, but it certainly isn't today. He has asked questions about injustice. Let me tell him about an injustice. It's an injustice when you force people who are working hard day and night to earn an income for their family, to pay more taxes because of a Labour Party economic policy in government that has led to the destruction of our economy. What do we see from the Labour Party? You earn more, they want you to pay more tax. You buy a home, they want you to pay more tax. You want to leave something to your children, they want you to pay more tax. Labour's £9 billion family tax. Labour used to have a slogan of education, education, education. Now it's just tax, tax, tax. I am a unionist with every fibre of my being, and that's why I was so aghast to hear Nicola Sturgeon's colleagues wishing to railroad through an independence referendum without a Section 30 order at a time when public services in Scotland are mismanaged and need that desperate resource, an economy that has stagnated and continually pursuing policies that cut off the circulation of our United Kingdom at Berwick and not because they are in the interests of Scotland. So will the Prime Minister join with me to condemn this illegal referendum approach and push the SNP to prioritise the areas that are actually in the interests of the people of Scotland? I say, my honourable friend is absolutely right. The SNP promised people in Scotland in 2014 that the independence referendum was a once in a generation vote. Now they're laying the foundation for another vote in just 18 months' time. The SNP uh, often claim, they stand up and claim it here in this House, that Scotland is being ignored. It's being ignored by an SNP government obsessed with another referendum against the wishes of a clear majority of Scots. People, I agree with my honourable friend. People in Scotland want a Scottish Government that focuses on improving their schools, on improving their health service, on improving their economy, not one that's obsessed by separation. Yeah. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I must say every time the Prime Minister speaks in Scotland our vote goes up. <laughs> Mr Speaker Mr Speaker Mr Speaker today. Mr Speaker, today is Srebrenica Memorial Day, and I trust that everyone in this House will want to recognise the unbelievable sacrifice that so many faced. Yesterday I met some of the survivors of genocide, and we must do all we can to make sure that we call out the genocide deniers, that we learn the lessons from man's inhumanity to man that we witnessed in the continent of Europe, and never again should this happen in Europe or anywhere else. Can I join with the Prime Minister in her words to Kim Darroch? It is a pity that the former Foreign Secretary, the candidate for leadership in the Tory party, did not stand up for our leading diplomat uh, in the United States yesterday. And, and lastly, Mr Speaker, can I also pay tribute to Winnie Ewing, who has her 90th birthday today, the only parliamentarian to sit in this House, in the Scottish Parliament and in the European Parliament. We remember the words of Winnie, stop the world. Scotland wants to get on. <laughs> Mr Speaker, Mark Carney has said that the UK economy does not appear to be growing. Danny Blanchflower, one of the few to predict the financial crisis in 2008, has said the early evidence suggests that the UK is already 
in recession. Mr Speaker, the dark clouds of Brexit are with us. Will the Prime Minister continue to ignore all the warning signs of recession? Yeah. Uh, Minister! Can I say to, first of all, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, uh, in relation to Srebrenica, I absolutely agree with him. We, we all must, we, we hope every time we see a massacre of this sort. We hope that humanity will learn from it. Sadly, all too often we see that is not the case. I was at the Western Balkan summit last Friday in Poland, uh, working with the countries of the Western Balkans, encouraging them and working with them to find uh, peaceful ways of uh, working together so that we can ensure that those countries see political stability and prosperity for their people in the future. Uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman then talks about the state of the UK economy. Well, I'm very pleased to see that we actually have the best record in the G7 in terms of growth. We have the longest quarterly uh, uh, period of growth of any of the countries in the, uh, in the G7. We also, I have to say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, we have record numbers of people in employment, a record low in unemployment, this is, and investment in our economy. This is an economy that is doing well, but it could really take off, and it would have done if the Right Honourable Gentleman had actually voted for Brexit and voted for the deal we put in this house. Ian Blackford. Mr Speaker, perhaps we can look at the facts. Record food bank use. Ernst & Young tell us that the Brexit bill so far for financial services companies alone is as much as four billion. Foreign investment projects into the UK have dropped 14 per cent, the lowest level in six years. Car production fell 15.5 per cent in May, the twelfth straight month of decline. UK retail sales have experienced their worst June on record. The near stagnation of the services sector in June is one of the worst performances seen over the past decade. We have the evidence, Prime Minister. Her, your legacy will be driving the UK economy over the cliff into another recession. Hasn't this Prime Minister sacrificed the jobs and livelihoods of people across the UK in order to please her Brexiteer backbenchers? Take no deal off the table and take positive action to restore confidence in the economy. The blame for any recession will lie at the door of this Brexit-obsessed government that is incapable of doing the D-job. Minister! Well, the Right Honourable Gentleman talks about the car industry. I'm sorry that in referencing uh, a car industry, he didn't reference the fact that in the last week we've seen the announcement by Jaguar Land Rover that they're going to manufacture electric vehicles in, in Castle Bromwich, say, preserving 2,700 jobs at the plant. We've also seen BMW announce they're going to manufacture the electric mini in, uh, in their Oxford plant, preserving 5,000 jobs in that, uh, in that plant. The Right Honourable Gentleman knows that he could have taken no deal off the table by voting for the deal. But if he wants to talk about economic forecasts and the future of economies, perhaps he should give a little more reflection on the fact that the forecasts for Scotland show that it will grow, its economy will grow slower than the rest of the United Kingdom over the next four years under an SNP government in Scotland. Chris Green. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Cross-work party work can be immensely beneficial, especially when delivering on the people's priorities. So will my uh, right and friend agree with me that the excellent work of Farnworth and Kearsley first, working with the Bolton Council leadership, which is now Conservative, to win an award from the Future High Streets Fund, because we can all agree that our high streets are the keystone of our local communities. Uh, well, can I say to my honourable friend that I think the point he makes is an absolutely excellent one, and what we have seen in the example he's quoted is the benefit of cross-party working. This can be immensely good, immensely positive for local communities. I'm delighted to hear that Bolton Council's bid for Farmworth Town Centre has been successful in progressing to the next phase of the Future High Streets Fund. He's right. We believe in our high streets. That's why we've created the High Streets Fund, and uh, I, this cross-party working by a Conservative-led Bolton Council has shown what can be achieved. Alex Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Children as young as seven have been groomed and exploited to commit crimes such as placing drugs inside their bodies to move them across the country, yet are often treated as criminals, not victims. Yeah. There's also a sad lack of support for them, with two-thirds of councils having no plan for tackling this kind of exploitation and just half collecting the data on those at risk. If she wants to secure any legacy on tackling modern-day slavery, will she instruct the Home Secretary to develop a cross-departmental strategy yeah, yeah, yeah. to tackle this despicable crime and 
end the criminalisation of these vulnerable youngsters. Uh, can I say to the honourable gentleman that uh, indeed we are continuing our work on tackling modern uh, slavery. I was pleased that the government re- uh, responded yesterday to the independent review of the Modern Slavery Act, uh, and we have taken on board most of the, the majority of the recommendations from that independent review. This includes, of course, looking at the uh, independent child uh, guardians that we have uh, uh, created, the, co- the concept that we created, looking at how they can give the support. The issue that he, rec- that he references of criminalisation of those who have been forced to undertake criminal activities was actually addressed in the Modern Slavery Act when it was put through this House. But we continue to look at what more we can do to ensure we are bringing an end to this crime, not just in the UK, but internationally as well. Sarah Newton. Speaker, due to extreme pressure on services across Cornwall, leaders of our health and care services have declared a critical incident. The pressure has impacted on the Royal Cornwall Hospital in particular. This is extremely worrying for all families across Cornwall who rely on Trelisk. Will my right hon. Friend assure me that she will do everything she can to enable health ministers to support leaders in Cornwall to resolve this situation as soon as possible? Prime Minister. Well, can I say to my hon. Friend that obviously this is a very important issue for her and for her constituents, and we are aware of the issues at the Royal Cornwall Hospital. We know the hospital is taking steps to rectify these. Of course, last winter, Cornwall Council was supported with over £2 million of additional funding to help alleviate the pressures on the NA- local NHS Trust. But I can assure my hon. Friend that my right hon. Friend the Secretary of State for Health is going to meet MPs uh, to discuss this matter and recognises the importance of this issue for her constituents. Sandy Martin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the run-up to the 2010 general election, the Conservatives in my constituency claimed that no children's centres would close, and yet, within a matter of months, they were closing them and downgrading those that remained. Now, Suffolk County Council is proposing to close half of those that remain, leaving just four full-time children's centres in Ipswich out of the original nine. So will the Prime Minister tell us what sort of guarantees the Government can give for any future policies which they want the British people to believe? (laughs) Prime Minister! Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, we obviously recognise the importance of ensuring that children have access to high-quality care. We have been putting extra money into social care, including for for uh, children, um, but it's also about the sort of services that, the, that uh, are delivered. It's important for us that we have taken a number of steps to improve the facilities that are available uh, to, for looking after children in, in uh, communities where those children require that. For example, the standards we've set for social workers, and uh, we do see the number of children's services that are rated outstanding growing across the country. I think that's important. That's a government that is actually looking at the issues that matter to parents and matter to children. Craig McKinley. My right honourable friend may be aware that live animal export season out of Ramsgate Port is shamefully in full swing with a further shipment due out tomorrow. Does my right honourable friend agree that long distance live animal exports, particularly across the Channel to an unknown future, should not form part of any future post Brexit agricultural policy, when we can be free of single market strictures which treat animals as mere goods. Mr. Can I say to uh, my honourable friend that obviously he has raised an issue that I know is of concern to a lot of people, and we are committed to maintaining our high standards on animal, animal welfare and food standards once we've left the uh, European Union. Um, We will be replacing, of course, the EU's common agricultural policy, Uh, and what we will be doing is enabling us, by being outside of the European Union, to take decisions for ourselves. So we will be able to determine these. I think that's an important and first step towards a better future for farming, for our natural world, Um, but it is also important for us to be able to do that and to maintain those high standards and quality standards for which we have a very good reputation across the world. Karen Smith. Mr Speaker, head teachers and parents in Bristol South tell me the lack of schools funding is impacting significantly on children with special educational needs, in addition to its wider impact on teaching across schools. Both the Prime Minister's potential successors now acknowledge schools are underfunded and have promised more money. Would she agree with me that this welcome new funding should be targeted at our most vulnerable yes. children? Yeah. 
Well, as Prime the Minister. Uh, as the lady knows, that there, uh, we are already putting more money into our schools. We are already putting more funding into special educational needs. I recognise the importance of ensuring that uh, special educational needs are properly uh, catered for and that the needs of those children can be uh, properly supported. That is why I am proud of the fact that we have been putting more money into our schools. What is important, of course, for schools is also what standards of education are provided within those schools. And, well, the Honourable Lady talks about teaching. Yes, teaching is an important element of that, and we thank all our teachers, both in mainstream schools and in special uh, educational needs schools, for the work that they do day in and day out. And I am pleased that we are seeing improved standards in our schools, and that means more young people, whether they are in mainstream schools or with special educational needs, having an opportunity to get, go far in life. Ben Bradley. Yeah. 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 The consequences yeah. of not leaving the European Union are profound, from the loss of trust in our democracy and institutions to the economic impact of civil unrest. Can my right honourable friend help to dispel the myth peddled by some in this House that we could simply go back to the way things were? And could she share what assessment government has made of these risks? Prime Minister. I say to the honourable gentleman that I absolutely agree with him that I think it is imperative for this House to deliver on the vote of the British people in 2016. I have said that on many occasions, standing at this dispatch box and elsewhere. I think it is important that we do that. We could already have done that. I'm sorry, I'm going to return to the, this theme, but we could already have done that had we uh, had this House supported the deal. It will be up to my successor to find a way through this to get a majority in this Parliament, but I agree that it is important that we do deliver trust in politics by saying to people, we gave you the choice, you told us your decision, we will now deliver on it. Justin Madden. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Vauxhall Motors in my, in my constituency in Ellesmere Port has a future if we can avoid crashing out of the EU without a deal. But my constituents are very concerned to hear the Prime Minister's potential successors in recent weeks talk up the prospects of a no-deal Brexit. So will she tell them both in no uncertain terms that if they pursue that option, they will consign thousands of jobs in my constituency and beyond to history? Yeah. Prime Minister! The Honourable Gentleman could have voted to save jobs in his constituency. Labour MPs trying to deny this. They had the opportunity three times to vote to leave with a deal, and three times they rejected it. And Mrs. Theresa Villiers. Mr. Speaker, many of my constituents are deeply opposed to the Mayor of London's plans to build over station car parks at High Barnet, Cock Fosters, and Finchley Central. Yeah, yeah. Will she urge the Mayor to drop these plans, which would only make life harder for long suffering commuters who just want to get to work and provide for their families? Prime Minister! Well, can I say to my right honourable friend, I'm sure she appreciates the emphasis that the Government has put on seeing more homes being built. We want to meet that ambition for 300,000 homes a year by the mid 2020s. It's a top priority for us, and London is a crucial part of achieving that ambition. But of course, while it's important to get the homes built, it's also vital that the impact on the local community is properly assessed when planning decisions are made. And I, I would say to my right honourable friend, we want to see more homes. They must need to be built in the right place, and local concerns need to be properly taken into account. Deirdre Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The APPG on electoral campaigning transparency is fairly new, but it's already very clear to us that something is rotten in the state of UK. The Prime Minister is legacy shopping, so uh, let me help. Will she commit to a clean-up of our election oh campaigning as a truly dignified legacy upon leaving office? She's refused to reveal her government spending uh, with Cambridge Analytica and AIQ. Will she, before she leaves, change tack and start a new era where elections and referendums can't be so easily rigged? The Prime Minister. Can I, can, I, can I first of all just say to the Honourable Lady, I've answered the question in relation to Cambridge Analytica on a number of occasions. In, it's been answered, it's been answered in uh, writing by, uh, the appropriate, to her by the appropriate minister. Can I also say to her, elections in this country are not rigged, as she has put it. The, uh, the referendum was not rigged. This is the, these are the views of the British people who go to those ballot boxes, who put their votes forward. And if the, if the Honourable Lady is so interested in ensuring that she is seeing democracy being respected, then she needs to ensure that she votes for a deal so we can deliver on the 2016 referendum. Robert Court! Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
The Oxford Diocesan Schools Trust is an academy schools trust that operates against the, across the Whitney uh, and Maidenhead constituencies. Will the Prime Minister join me with in, joining, uh, in celebrating their successes, such as at Holyport Primary School in her constituency and outstanding rated Bryce Norton Primary School in my constituency? And would she further agree this is a real example of how academisation can really work in rural constituencies like ours? Well, can I say to my honourable friend that I'm very happy to join him in congratulating the Oxford Arson Schools Trust in the success that they've seen. I'm also happy to congratulate Hollyport uh, Primary School in the, uh, in the uh, recognition they have received uh, as a good school, and to recognise Bryce Norton Primary in my honourable friend's constituency, uh, who were rated outstanding. I think this does show that smaller schools in rural areas can provide an excellent quality of education, and that the, the academy movement can provide for those, uh, for those um, schools and for those children. And it goes back to the point I was making earlier. What matters is the quality of education our children receive. And in Hollyport and in Bryce Norton, they're receiving first-class education. Yes, now. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this week the Stoke Contract Hardship Commission published its report that demonstrated that income, education and employment were the driving factors of poverty in our city. I've sent the Prime Minister a copy and I would invite her to read it. But may I ask her to use what time and authority she has left in her office to look at fixing universal credit, to look at funding our schools and our further education colleges properly, and to raise the national living wage rate for under 25 so that collectively we can deal with the root causes of poverty. Can I, can I say to the honourable gentleman that he's raised a number of issues there. He will know that I believe that universal credit actually is a better system than the legacy system we inherited from the last Labour government. I think it does help people into the workplace. It ensures that as they earn more, they, do, they do, uh, are able to keep more of that money. And on the issue of further education funding, I've already indicated uh, on the back of the Auger review, which looked at uh, post-18 -edu education, I think it is important that we ensure that our further education colleges are funded and able to provide an alternative route through education for those young people for whom that is right. Rudy Harrison. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would my right honourable friend join with me in commending the hard work and dedication of staff at West Cumberland Hospital, the North Cumbria Trust, the Working Together Group and my fantastic community for their innovation and commitment, which in addition with the over £100 million of investment from this Conservative Government means that consultant-led maternity will be staying open yeah, for yeah, future yeah. generations. Yeah. Yeah. Can I... Can I... Uh, first of all, can I pay tribute to my honourable friend? This is an issue on which I know she has been campaigning long and hard uh, on behalf of her constituents. And we welcome the CCG's decision to retain those consultant-led services in West Cumbria. Um, better births established that personalised care means safer care, and greater choice should be made available to women accessing maternity services. And they should be able to make decisions about the support they need during birth and where they prefer to give birth. I think this is a good decision that has been taken, and I once again congratulate my honourable friend for the campaign she's run on this. Mary Glinda. Thank yeah, you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Her government has once more lost in court to a public sector union, the FBU, over pensions. And whilst fighting this case, the government penalised all public sector workers by suspending pension valuations, meaning poorly paid frontline civil servants, many in the PCS union, not only being denied money they are owed, but also making monthly pension over payments of 2%. When will the Prime Minister give these loyal workers money that is rightfully theirs? Yeah. Prime Minister! Can I say to the Honourable Lady, of course, as she's uh, made clear, there has been a case recently in the courts in relation to uh, public sector pensions, in particular, in particular aspects of public sector pensions. We will, of course, have to look at the implications of that uh, judgment across uh, public sector pensions, and it is right with that we take our time and make our decisions. Government makes its decisions based yeah. on that careful consideration. Jack yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am extremely proud to represent a constituency with world-leading defence manufacturing which underpins our country's credibility as an ally and strategic partner. So does my honourable friend agree with me that as we contemplate our fantastic future role in the world as an independent, self-governing and sovereign nation, yeah, the yeah. UK must continue to be a credible partner and ally in an increasingly dangerous world? And does she also agree with 
with me that her successor should commit our country to a fully funded defence budget so we can remain a tier one military power. Yeah. Prime Minister! Can I say to my honourable friend, uh, first of all, can I commend our world leading defence manufacturers? They are an important industry, not only providing for us here in the United Kingdom, but also in terms of the significant exports and the jobs that they, uh, that they create and that they support here in the United Kingdom. It is important that as that independent, self governing, sovereign nation, we are a a good partner and ally in what is an uncertain world. We always have been that and we will continue to be that. We continue to uh, spend, meet the NATO requirement of spending 2% of our GDP on defence. We are one of the few NATO countries that does that. We are the biggest European uh, contributor to NATO. We are the second biggest contributor to NATO. Uh, we are a leading military power and we will re- re- remain a leading military power. Mr. Greedy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. During our Premiership, we have marked 100 years since the armistice of the Great War, 100 years of women's suffrage, 70 years of the NHS, the Treaty of Rome and the Universal Declaration on on human rights. 20 years of declaration, and a week on Saturday will mark 50 years since the moon landings, one of the greatest human endeavours ever accomplished. In 50 or 100 years' time, won't history judge Brexit and her legacy to have been one giant leap backwards for the people of these islands? Yeah. Prime Minister! No. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Sorry I didn't hear you the first time. Mr Speaker, the Eden Project, Eden Centre, wants to come to the north of England, to Morecambe. Um, I would like to have a meeting with the Chancellor and the Prime Minister to talk about putting Eden into Morecambe to make sure it's the jewel in the north-west that it should be. Prime Minister! I say to my honourable friend that I was not aware that, uh, previously that the Eden Project wanted to come to, uh, to Morecambe, and I'm sure I'm happy to arrange suitable conversations for him so that he can make that case. Paul Sherry! Thank you, Mr Speaker. A dental practice in my constituency has this week been forced to close due, due to unfair NHS dental contracts, leaving yet a another neighbourhood without any dental service at all. Residents who urgently need care have had to get treatment from Dentaid, a charity set up to provide dental services in the world's most deprived countries. So does the Prime Minister accept that the real decay is in the values of a society that does not provide free health care to all of its citizens and that it is her government that is responsible? And when will she keep her promises to my constituents and guarantee that all of them, wherever they live, can access NHS dental care when they Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, my understanding was that the CCCG actually had a responsibility in ensuring the provision of uh, dental care in uh, their areas, uh, but I will ask the Department of Health to look at the specific case she's raised. You, Mr Speaker, I commend the Prime Minister on her leadership ensuring that this Government legislated for the net zero carbon emissions target for 2050. Um, the Prime Minister, I'm sure, would agree that the next step is to make sure that we can how we plan to do this, make sure we improve our economy and improve our living standards and not destroy it. And I'm hosting a conference in my constituency to talk about this issue. Would she agree to be the guest speaker? <laughs> Prime Minister. First of all, first of all, can I absolutely agree with my honourable friend that I think initiatives such as he's shown at the local level are a very important part of the wider work we're doing in relation to climate change and in relation to making sure that we leave the environment in a better state for the next generation. Uh, and uh, I thank him for his invitation. Uh, can I say to my honourable friend, I will indeed look to see how busy my diary is in the autumn. Um, but I'm grateful to. Him. Well, you never know, I might have a bit more free time in the autumn, uh, but this is an important issue and I commend the fact that he is taking this initiative at a local level because encouraging and raising awareness of climate change at a local level is important for all of us. It's certainly an innovative approach to the issue of invitations, upon which the Honourable Gentleman is doubtless to be complimented. Hugh Gaffney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. There are nearly 50 dog attacks on postal workers every week in the UK, which is why I back the Communication Workers Union Dog Awareness Week this, in this week in the campaign. I hope the Prime Minister will join me in both supporting Dog Awareness Week campaign and recognising the law is not currently fit for purpose. So will the Prime Minister support Royal Mail and Parcel Force postal workers by launching an independent review and the effectiveness of the Dangerous Dogs Act and the wider 
dog control. Thank you. Prime Minister! As I say, Honourable Gentlemen, obviously a number of steps have been taken over the years in relation to, uh, to dogs and uh, 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 legislating in relation to dangerous dogs. Can I also say to him, though, I think we all recognise the uh, problems that some postal workers do face uh, when they uh, exper- experience and are subject to attacks from dogs, when they're just going about their business, going about their job, and going about a job which is of benefit to, uh, to the people of our constituencies. Yes. Maria Caulfield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week has been a game changer in politics in Northern Ireland, with this place uh, legislating for devolved issues, but also the sad death of Sir Anthony Hart, who chaired the historical investigational abuse inquiry, investigating the rape, Prime Minister, and sexual abuse of thousands of the most vulnerable children in Northern Ireland between 1922 to 1995. Some were raped for months, some for decades. Would the Prime Minister commit to bring forward the legislation for common compensation for those victims before the summer recess to give them the justice they deserve. Minister. Obviously, uh, the, uh, so I say, first of all, can I say to my honourable friend that uh, I would like to pass my condolences to the family and friends of Sir Anthony, who did an excellent job in the Hart Inquiry, shining a light on to some horrific incidents that took place in Northern Ireland. Um, obviously, this was an issue that was on uh, one of the amendments last uh, night as the bill was going forward. And obviously, as that bill uh, goes through its passage in this Parliament, the Government will look carefully at, uh, at these issues. Sir Vincent Cable. Uh, the Prime Minister's last major duty will be to recommend her successor. Uh, how does she <laughs> plan to satisfy herself that the next leader of the Conservative Party will command a majority in the House of Commons. Minister! Can I say to the uh, the right honourable gentleman, the next leader of the Conservative Party will, I believe, be an excellent Prime Minister, whichever of the candidates wins, and uh, they will ensure ensure that they take take this country through Brexit, deliver on the 2016 referendum, ignore the attempts by the right honourable gentleman and his honourable friends to try and go back on the democratic vote of the British people and lead us forward to a brighter future. Uh, Mr. Speaker, early diagnosis is key to further improvements in the survival rates for breast cancer. So, with this in mind, is the Prime Minister aware of the Change and Check campaign being run by Helen Addis, a member of the ITV Lorraine Shield team? And will she join me in congratulating Helen for this excellent initiative, which is already saving lives, particularly at a time when she's going through what she describes as her own breast cancer journey herself? Can I I say to my honourable friend that he's raised a very important issue, and I recognise the work that he has done on this uh, this particular particular issue, and I will look carefully at the specifics of the issue that he's raised and respond to him in writing. Mr Speaker, a Nottinghamshire woman whose husband is in prison for her attempted murder was yesterday served with a letter from his lawyers demanding £100,000 as a settlement for their divorce. She would have to sell her family home to give him this. It is just simply wrong. Will the Prime Minister support a change in the law to remove automatic entitlement of joint assets in cases like this? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, she's inviting me to comment on a matter that is currently before the courts and obviously will be determined by, through, our justice, uh, through our justice system. Uh, and I think it, we have very careful legislation in this country in relation to uh, divorce and in relation to the uh, arrangements that take part in, uh, uh, after that. And I think it is right that this is, that this is a case, obviously, as she said, that is going through the courts. Thank you, Mr Speaker. North Dorset is predominantly an agricultural constituency. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that were we to leave on WTO terms, it is likely to be RIP for British agriculture? Can I I say to my honourable friend um, that I think it is important on all of us, incumbent on all of us, as we look to the future, to ensure that we are taking into account the needs of all parts of our country, of all industries and of all sectors of employment in our country. I continue to believe uh, that the deal that was negotiated, which would indeed have uh, uh, ensured the continuation of our agricultural sector, was the right way forward. What we will be able to do post-Brexit is to establish our own rules uh, in relation to support for the farming industry here in the United Kingdom, which will be to our benefit. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent, Lizanne Zeitzman, who has made her home on the island of Aaron with her husband, has been told by the Home Office that she must leave the UK by Friday the 12th of July. 
Arran residents are understandably angry and upset at the prospect of losing this valued member of their community, and a petition over a few days has garnered over 16,000 signatures. Will the Prime Minister urgently intervene and instruct the Immigration Minister to meet with me so that we can ensure that Lausanne can continue living, working and contributing to the island of Arran? Yeah. We have a set of immigration rules. It is right that the Home Office enforces those immigration rules, but I will ensure that the Immigration Minister responds to, responds to the Honourable Lady on the particular case. Thank you. Order. If members leaving the chamber could do so quickly and quietly, that, that would greatly assist us. Uh, well, I know 